Good evening. A big search involving a helicopter today failed to find an Invercargill man missing after fishing off the rocks at Slope Point in the Catlins. 32-year-old Paul Brand was reported missing yesterday afternoon after failing to return home from a day's fishing. A decision will be made tonight on whether to continue searching tomorrow. The Yellow Eyed Penguin Trust has joined those speaking out against an Omaru proposal to establish a tip close to the Bushy Beach Reserve. The Trust believes it would lead to an increase in ferrets and cats, both of which kill penguin and shearwater chicks. Bushy Beach is a nesting area for the birds. The Trust is astounded the local authorities could consider squandering what it believes is enormous tourism potential and favours an alternative site well away from the beach. A public meeting will be held in Omaru later in the month to thrash out the issue. Port of Otago Limited came into being today. The company takes over the commercial activities of the Otago Harbour Board and will operate in the style of a state-owned enterprise. Most of the land and assets from the Harbour Board go to the new port company chaired by Sir Clifford Skeggs. Soon, the Harbour Board will become part of the Otago Regional Council, which will look after planning, recreation and some harbour land. The dawn was still breaking as guests gathered at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Georgetown for Invercargill's wedding of the year. Tying the knot was international Rose of Tralee, Mary Ann Murphy, who was obviously keen to get proceedings underway. The early start was chosen so the two far-flung families could enjoy all the day together after attending a real wedding breakfast at Mary Ann's workplace, the Grand Hotel. It also meant rugby fans could view the test later in the day without conflict. School teacher groom Bob Ward and his bride will shortly head off on an overseas holiday. The highlight will come in Ireland in August when Mary Ann hands over her Rose of Tralee title. Two Dunedin teenagers had a narrow escape when their car left the road near Portobello this afternoon and plunged into the Otago Harbour. Alan Brady has the details. Britannia ruled just below the waves and the beginnings of an oil slick smeared the surface after the crash. Lawrence Baird of McAndrew Bay and Madeline Callister of Portobello managed to escape with bumps and bruises and the shock of an unexpected midwinter swim. And that's what tow truck driver Rob Everest had to endure in the line of duty as he hooked up to the submerged vehicle. Police say it appeared the car left the road after rounding a bend near Portobello on its way to Dunedin. The waterlogged and bedraggled 1954 Morris Minor will need time to dry out before it takes to the road again. And its owner may well want to change the number on the driver's door. In an item we ran last week on car insurance, we raised the question of whether higher premiums are justified in Otago by more road accidents. Ministry of Transport officials say not, and they've praised local drivers for the care they take on slippery roads. Now it seems Dunedin drivers do need to take extra care because the roads here have an extra polish. Michael Lynch reports. The volcanic rock that goes to make the gravel chips to coat the roads around Dunedin is some of the toughest in the country. Trouble is, it may be just too tough. Traffic engineers are measuring a growing problem of surface polishing round an Eden. Simply, when the surface of the gravel gets shiny, roads get slippery in the wet. A road here may last only five years before needing a reseal, against 15 in other places where the rock's less dense and less prone to polishing. Heavy trucks are taking their share of the blame. Their power steering scrubs the road. The torque and power of their big engines can turn their tyres into buffing pads. Are we doing a study on, on the effect of trucks on the road? At this stage, I'm, I'm trying to find out if the chip polishing is a problem, if, if we find it is a problem of um, reasonable size, we'll then have to seek funding maybe from the road research unit to look at what causes it. Michael Kane emphasises polishing is only one roading problem. Tar seal faults are more often the cause of roads breaking up. Polishing's a relatively new concern. Mr O'Kane is reluctant to call it a problem. As far as I know, there's no published reports on chip polishing. Is the Roads Board doing any work on this? Are you bringing out any reports? We are looking at what causes chip polishing. But whatever causes the polishing, it's here to stay. And the Roads Board is looking at the economics of bringing in crushed gravel from north or south Otago for the real problem areas. 
The Gore Boat Club was blessed with perfect racing conditions for its 25th anniversary at the weekend. The event was popular enough to attract 60 boats, and Kim Haring reports that's due partly to the fact it's a family boat race. The boats that lined up on Lake Wakatipu on Saturday looked like they were here for a picnic lunch. Few of them are the souped-up monsters that make northern motor racing look glamorous. In fact, the most advanced boat to enter didn't even start because it blew a gearbox. The bread and butter event is the nominated speed race. These boats don't have to set a sizzling speed, just nominate a speed and stick to it as constantly as they can. The winner, Ivan Ingham, was remarkably only 13 seconds outside his nominated time. Over 63 kilometres, that's pretty accurate. Second in that event was a local tourist hydrofoil. As for the straight-out speed event, that was won by a late entry, Scott Rhodes of Christchurch. And second, Stephen Pope from Gore. Well, it looks like you can throw your greenhouse effect theories out the window. Central Otago is revelling in a nice cold start to the real winter. Ski fields are opening up all over the place. And, of course, there's no snow without ice, or so says Mark Price. The Idaburn Dam near Oturihua is at its most picturesque when there's a bit of snow around. But down there on the ice, there's no time to take in the scenery. Ice hockey has slowly become a fully-fledged winter sport. In the Southern League, there are seven teams. Oteri Hua in the yellow takes on a South Canterbury team, drawing three all. It should be a good season for increasing numbers of young skaters. But while more towns in the South now have artificial rinks, there are those who wouldn't really be welcome anywhere else but on a big natural rink. And here's something you couldn't do on an artificial rink. What is it, four inches? No, I bet. The Dunedin and Cromwell underwater clubs carved a hole in the ice and 16 divers had a look at what lies beneath. Oh, a bit murky. A bit murky. Yeah, the visibility's not the best at you all. Get much, you get much light through from there? From about, uh, oh, about six feet and then it starts to darken up as you get deeper. How cold do you get? Oh, not too bad around the body, but around the mouth and the and up around the forehead. <laughs> you get quite cold. Freeze yeah. the brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The diving was treated as a search and rescue exercise with a support team from the Red Cross. Oturi has had six consecutive frosts, the best one minus 12 degrees, and if that keeps up, it shouldn't be too long before curling begins. Good stuff for people who are having a midterm break at the moment. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night. Yeah.